All right, it's Saturday night. I'm in my house. You should also be in your house. I'm in my house wearing a sailor shirt because I'm gonna to talk to you about a boat. And is it a good boat? Well, uh, yes. Uh, it's a good boat that got mixed up in some very bad things and it had a very, very strange life. Uh, the boat was designed in 1907. It was completed in 1911. It finally went out of service in 1950 and was only scrapped in 1973. It entered service under, by the grace of God, King of Prussia and Emperor of the German Reich, Kaiser Wilhelm, and left service as an active naval vessel in a NATO Navy of the Republic of Turkey. In its long, incredibly bizarre career, there were hat disguises, there were various toilet-based uh, boat refit scandals, there were some illegal acts of war, um, and really a lot more punishment than any one boat, well, I should say ship, could ever take. So I've got my sailor shirt on, I've got my cheap whiskey I've stockpiled, and I'm going to tell you about the long, bizarre career of what was built as the SMS Goeben and wound up ending its career as the Turkey Cumhuriyet Geminsi Yavuz. So before we get into the story of the boat, we have to talk about the boat, right? The Yavuz was a battle cruiser. And Battle Cruiser is this weird thing because it's named and featured a lot in science fiction, right? Uh, you watch Star Wars, there's Battle Cruisers. You play StarCraft, there's Battle Cruisers. Everyone says Battle Cruiser. What the hell is a Battle Cruiser? What does that even mean? It sounds kind of badass. Well, a Battle Cruiser is a concept that came out of the late 19th century, early 20th century, and it was come up with a guy by the name of Jackie Fisher, right? Mm-hmm. Now, Jackie Fisher would probably be the subject of a completely different video. Um, and he is one of those bizarre weirdos that really only the Victorian era could produce. He was born to a family of colonial administrators in Sri Lanka. He would attend up to three church services a day every Sunday and just like yell about them the rest of the day. He was obsessed with dancing and ballroom dancing and would force his junior officers to uh, ballroom dance with each other on the decks of ships while the officers dined. And if anyone would not dance uh, ballroom, uh, he would dock their leave and keep them on the ship and not let them go on vacation. So he was a deeply bizarre man. And he's one of the most legendary figures in British naval history, but he was never a fighting admiral. He was a planner, he was a shipbuilder, and he was a naval theorist. So when you're in the 1890s, bear with me. When you're in the 1890s, basically battleships, naval power, they're these weird agglomerations of coal-powered, hotel-looking, just like, I hate to say it, steampunk kind of things, right? Now we call them a pre-dreadnought, right? Now, no one at the time called them a pre-dreadnought because there was no dreadnought, but we're getting to, we're getting, we're getting to dreadnought. Um, they were coal-fired with it was called a triple expansion steam engine, you know, the big ones that go like tsh, 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 like that. And they would be mounted with basically this whole smorgasbord of different types of guns, right? You had little guns for shooting at the little torpedo boats. You had medium guns for shooting at what was like a cruiser. And a cruiser is a, a medium-sized warship that sails around on its own, has very long range, and messes with another country's commerce, right? So they had medium guns to fight cruisers, and then they would have like two to four big guns to fight other battleships. Jackie Fisher looks over a bunch of the data from like the Russo-Japanese War and some of these late conflicts and realizes that really a lot of the ship design with these medium guns and also the, you know, the light armor, medium armor, heavy armor belts, that's just kind of a waste of time. That only really one type of gun ever really makes an actual kill in a naval battle, which there have been very few of before the First World War. And he decides to put forward an idea, right? And he puts forward an idea about a, a type of battleship that really only has main guns, right? Which vastly simplifies aiming them, which is done through a uh, mechanical rangefinder hooked up to these crude computers, right? In the early 20th century. 
Um, you have to determine where your shots are hitting by looking at the splash of the shell. So if there's only one type of gun, it's very easy to determine where all of them are going. It's very easy to sight them all in. It's very easy to calculate the trajectories because there's only one kind of shell that they're firing. And the overall effect is much more effective, much more powerful. He creates an idea for what's called the all big gun battleship. And, uh, he combines this with a couple of other emergent technologies of the time. Not the big choof, choof, choof engines, but turbines, right? Turbines burning fuel oil um, that generate much, much higher power, much faster speed, greater reliability. And he combines that with some new ways of creating armor, which kind of don't really bother with like the weak little armor for the little guns and the medium armor for the little guns. He's like, that's all a waste of time, right? Because... Uh, you really just need what's called like all or nothing armor. Okay, technically that comes around later, but like bear with me. Basically one big, big belt of main armor to just protect what's essential in the ship with everything not essential on the outside of it. You know, unessential stuff like sailors, quarters, and you know, shit you don't really need. Um, and so he comes up with this idea for a revolutionary new type of battleship, right? They're called pre-dreadnoughts because they're all the battleships built before the HMS dreadnought, which Jackie Fisher comes up with. And Jackie Fisher creates this, this dreadnought, this, this battleship with these all big guns, with these turbine engines, with this new armor scheme. And everyone all around the world is like, oh shit, uh, this battleship could sink our whole Navy. This is so much more effective. This is so much better, right? Our existing navies are obsolete. He changed the world, but in true British fashion, he wasn't really happy with that. Instead, the apple of his eye, the real conceptual ideal that he wanted, the thing he wanted to get the Admiralty to endorse and build his vision was something called a battle cruiser. Because, so the world of the early 20th century was actually incredibly globalized with a huge, huge volume of international trade. I know we don't think about that and we think that like global supply chains and like getting your fruit or meat transported in from another continent is a kind of like modern luxury, you know, like all the shit that's currently falling apart outside. Um, but it's not. In the late 19th and early 20th centuries, a lot of countries were, you know, trading very, very heavily with each other, right? I mean, like before the First World War, Britain's biggest trade partner was Germany. Uh, there was a huge volume of international trade. And Jackie Fisher saw that Britain would be controlling the world based on controlling this trade. And the way to do that was what he originally called like super cruisers, right? Those little medium-sized independent ships, but bigger. But he eventually settled on and he convinced the British Admiralty to build something called a battle cruiser, which his, his dream was basically a battleship-sized ship with battleship-sized all big guns like the HMS Dreadnought, but lighter armor that allowed a much higher speed. So basically the idea being a ship that could fight anything it couldn't run from and could run from anything it couldn't fight. And his vision for British imperial control of the world was a fleet of these battle cruisers stationed all over the world in these regional ports that could dart out to stop an enemy from raiding British vessels, like, like merchant ships, like commerce, and could at will outrun any possible interception to blow up an enemy's um, trade, basically. Uh, he eventually got the Admiralty to agree to build these things because he pointed out in a major fleet battle with another real big navy um, this was the days before radio, so, you know, these battle cruisers could go and basically destroy the enemy's reconnaissance force before they could locate your own main fleet. So he kind of sold them on a twofer. He was like, look, these battle cruisers, you can use them in a big fleet battle. You can also use them off on their own. And, uh, you know, people were like, yeah, okay, Jackie, you did us one really good with this HMS Dreadnought. Everyone's scared shitless. What the hell? We'll build some battle cruisers. But the real thing the HMS Dreadnought did was not be an effective warship. It only ever sank one ship, and that was by ramming it. That's another story. What it did was it made every Navy on Earth obsolete. And what it did was it kicked off a global arms race. Because suddenly, if the Royal Navy has one of these Dreadnoughts, all you got to do is have two of these Dreadnoughts, right? And you're in business, buddy. Um, and so it kicks off an arms race. And it kicks off an arms race uh, primarily history focuses on the naval arms race between like Germany and Britain. Germany gets into it for its own dumb reasons. They get into this big dick-waving pissing contest with Britain. 
everyone's got to build battleships and the you know the british start building battle cruisers and the germans are like okay we're gonna build some battle cruisers right with the idea not that they be far-flung kind of a global striking force because germany didn't really have much of a global colonial empire except for like namibia where they genocided a bunch of people and papua new guinea where i think they thought about genociding people and then a bunch of extremely strange islands and then the small parts of west africa that to this day still make german style bitters uh which is really interesting shout out to the former gold coast colony um so the german focus on building when they build their own battle cruisers is building these things ready for a fleet action and that's where the uh the yavu is the subject of this video at the time called the sms gerben really starts taking shape so it's built as one of these big fleet laws right these uh, basically defense authorization bills that start building up the imperial german navy into a world force to rival the british um as designed in 1907 and as finished in 1911 uh fully loaded the sms govan slash yavuz uh weighs about or displaces about 25,000 tons of water right you sit it in there 25,000 tons of water gets pushed out of the way um, it has a main belt armor in terms of like that primary th at its thickest armor is, uh, 11 inches thick of laminated Krupp steel. So it is just a little under a pure foot of just hardened alloy steel to stop incoming shells. Um, it mounts for its main armament, armament, Jesus, armament. Uh, it has five gun turrets, each mounting two 11-inch guns. Um, what's interesting about when Germany starts building these, because these aren't really intended to be like globe-trotting ships, right? These aren't the, the British vision of a ship that will sail the ocean, sweeping everything out of its path and controlling global sea trade. No, no, no. They're designing these to act as fast reconnaissance killing enemy cruisers to hide the location of the German battle fleet as it rides out to fight the British, right? So they make a couple little different things, right? Um, the HMS Dreadnought had 12-inch guns, and by 11-inch, 12-inch guns, I mean the width of the actual shell, like how wide around the shell is, right? 11-inch um, guns are actually pretty small for the time being um, in terms of the bore diameter but the Imperial German Navy made a decision that they were going to make their guns smaller to shoot shells at higher velocity, hoping that that would crack through opposing armor. Um, I have actually seen in person one of the shells from the former Gav Yavuz or Goben or whatever we're calling it. At this point, we'll just call it the Goben. I almost accidentally dropped one on my foot at the Istanbul Naval Museum in 2012, and I'm glad I didn't because it was still huge and heavy. Um, so it, it mounts 12 of these, uh, sorry, it mounts 10 of these big 11-inch guns. Um, it mounts 12 smaller 6-inch guns, but those are the only ones they really mess around with. They're not about this medium gun stuff when it comes to building battle cruisers in 1907, right? And then it weirdly mounts four underwater torpedo tubes pointing out at different angles because for some reason they got this really cool idea that they were going to be shooting torpedoes at people. I don't know why. Uh, but that's what they thought. And to my knowledge and in everything that I've researched for this, they never once fired a torpedo out of these fucking things and it was a really bad idea. Uh, the crew was uh, a little close to like 1,150 people. Uh, sorry, men. It was just dudes. It was dudes rock, dude time, literal sausage fest because they're Germans. And uh, only about 45 of these were officers, right? So a turn of the century or early 20th century battleship or battle cruiser was a very hierarchical place where everyone basically sat, they did their job, you probably didn't have a window, you weren't told what was going on, and this cadre of about 45 to 50 guys basically ran everything. So there's a couple things that make it mm, maybe not quite a globe-spanning ship, right? There's a couple things that they did very differently. Believe it or not, that 11-inch thick armor that ringed the main belt of the ship was actually pretty thin. Um, battle cruisers were not meant to be as heavily armored as battleships. And uh, they were, you know, sort of like in boxing what's called a glass jaw puncher. They could dish it out, but they could not take it. Uh, the Imperial German Navy made a decision, and this is going to have some repercussions through the rest of this story, 
to, even if they were sacrificing armor, build the ship in a way that it had a lot of small internal rooms that had watertight doors. So even if it was heavily damaged, you could stop flooding, right? Shells might punch through, the ship might get messed up, but you can close these watertight doors, watertight doors in much smaller rooms and sections than uh, say an equivalent British or French or Italian ship and stop flooding. It made them miserable to live on, but they also didn't ever really expect that you'd be living on these long because the whole idea was that you would just be sailing out into the North Sea between the British Isles and, you know, Denmark and that and duking it out with the British in a short little battle and that would be fine. It didn't need to be comfortable. It didn't need to be nice because you certainly weren't sending these on long campaigns and you certainly weren't going to be sending this sort of ship uh, far away. Which is, of course, exactly what happened to the SMS Goeben throughout its entire service life. It leaves German waters in, I think, like 1910, and it never comes back. Um, and the ship is put into the water. It's named a Modka class. You can tell a country has no naval tradition when they are naming their ships after generals, which it is, is the Goben itself is named after some guy from the 1870s, and the Moltke class is named after Helmut von Moltke, who was a famous general, and so Germany's getting really pumped. They are a naval power now. You know, this HMS Dreadnought business has created a clean slate where any navy in the world can build up and get ready to just take on the Brits head to head. Um, but... Germany doesn't just want to build a navy, they also want to be a global power, right? I remember mentioned those crappy little colonies they got that weren't very profitable. Well, you know, everyone just has to fucking kill and exploit some brown people in the early 20th century if you're going to be taken seriously on the world stage. And uh, Kaiser Wilhelm II takes that very self-consciously. So even before his navy really gets built up, he starts sending them all out over the world, picking fights, grabbing any little territory he can, uh, creating naval bases kind of just to have them to brag about them, right? So the Germans get these weird little colonies in these far off places like the Qingdao Peninsula in China, which coincidentally is why the Qingdao Lager beer is a light and tasty uh, German style lager to this day. Um, but more to the point, he starts creating far-flung naval squadrons, right? Units of ships permanently stationed in these colonies. So you have the, like, Ostasian Flottille, or whatever, I don't speak German anymore. Um, they create a little, you know, flotilla of ships out in China. That's the East Asian fleet. They create a little flotilla of ships, well, kind of nowhere else, because, you know, no one's, like, Namibia then, not now, isn't really a hotbed of, like, geopolitical intrigue. But you know where it is, where all the business happens. Where it is that interesting place where great powers play their games to this day is the Mediterranean. Right? Everyone loves the Mediterranean. you got to have a fleet in the Mediterranean. There's so many things around it. You can go so many places. Right? And uh, many of the many crises, or what were at the time called war scares, that led up to the First World War happened in the Mediterranean. Some of them even about boats themselves. Kaiser Wilhelm got a little too big for his britches and ordered a German gunboat called the Panther to just like show up in Morocco in like 1910 or 11 and caused this thing called the Panther Crisis basically just by being a dick with a boat. And while that might have deterred a lesser man, he was pretty into it. So, what does he do? Well, he creates a Mediterranean squadron, right? He decides that the German Empire needs a full-time naval presence in the Mediterranean. And copying the British in their ideas, if not necessarily the design of their battle cruisers, he decides to send a battle cruiser. And so the SMS, Zina Majestate Schiff, or his slash hers Majesty ship, Goeben, gets orders, I think sometime in uh, 1911 or maybe 1912, uh, to go and establish a Mediterranean naval presence for Imperial Germany under the command of uh, Captain Souchon, who has a French name for some reason I have not been able to determine. 
um, the Goeben, along with a smaller ship, a cruiser called the Breslau, set sail from, I think, Wilhelmshaven and uh, sail into the Mediterranean at a time of, of growing international crisis. And this is where we really get to the actual kind of core of the story, which is how this one boat, this battleship, this multi-class battle, sorry, battleship, battle cruiser, the uh, SMS Goeben, plays a pivotal role in the history of the modern Middle East and winds up at the middle of a bunch of incredibly bizarre stuff that uh, the repercussions of with which we are still feeling to this day. Um, so Choo Choo, they sail down. But the Mediterranean in the 1910s was a very tense and a very fraught place. And that is because of a subject very near and dear to my heart, the Ottoman Empire. This is primarily a video about what happens to this boat in the Ottoman Empire. Um, the Ottoman Empire, you know, started in, uh, what, like 1299, Western Anatolia, you know, big into that Turkish, Ghazi, Sunni, Islamic kind of thing, high Middle Ages, wonderful culture, the poetry, the, you know, meeting of civilizations, blah, blah, blah. You have, you know, 600 years of relative stability and effective administration in the entire Middle East, North Africa region, plus the Balkans. Well, by the time you get to like 1910, that's not really the story anymore. Things are looking pretty bad. And the Ottoman Empire has had a series of pretty bad experiences, which are leading them to want a navy, right? And really driving home to them that you kind of need these really cool boats to be taken seriously in the 20th century as a global power. Um, the Ottoman Empire is losing territory pretty rapidly. Um, I think in contrast to a lot of perceptions of it today, uh, the Ottoman Empire, its, its heartlands were never really the Middle East or even Anatolia, even modern Turkey. Uh, the real core of the empire, its richest provinces and the places that most of its leadership came from were the Balkans, right? Except, uh, well, the Balkans are kind of, there's this nationalism thing going on and a bunch of countries like Serbia, you know, like uh, Bulgaria, no longer really vibing with the whole being ruled by a Muslim sultan from you know, Istanbul kind of a thing. And they've been losing territory pretty consistently for the past, you know, call it 100 years. And um, very specifically, there's a series of short, sharp shocks that the Ottoman government, that the, the Sultan, the Sublime Port, receives that make it very clear that they need some kind of effective navy, right? Um, in 1897, reversing the trend of the Ottoman Empire getting drawn into wars with various European states or various regional rivals that they then immediately lose, then the European states step in, then the European states say, we're taking away these provinces from you, deal with it, and then they have no choice to back down. They get into this short little war with Greece in 1897, which they actually, it's over like a rebellion on the island of Crete. It's, it's a whole, it's a whole thing. Uh, but they actually mop the floor with the Greeks. They cream them. Um, and it's, a, it's battling mostly on the Ottoman-Greek border, which is on the northern edge of the Aegean, which is a very rough and hospitable territory, but you can resupply it by sea very easily, right? So most of the logistics, the troop movements, the supplies are going uh, through the Aegean to the armies on the front in like kind of near Salonika, right? And um, the Ottomans just win, which is kind of rare for them at this point, right? 1878, the turkish War, they eventually lose after a big bloodbath. Um, there are probably a couple in there somewhere else, but they, you know, they win and that's awesome. And they're like, Hey, we did it. Our military modernization is working. We don't have to, you know, take crap from all these Western European powers anymore, blah, 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 blah. Uh, here's the thing. They defeat the Greeks and then a coalition of Western European powers just sails a fleet into the Aegean and says, actually, you know what? We think you lost that. Give Greece Crete. And they have to, um, because they don't have an effective way navally of countering something like that that would stop their supply transports through the Aegean Ocean. Um, 1911, the Italo-Turkish War. This is Italy in a rebound after getting uh, their shit kicked in by Ethiopia just a, a scant decade earlier, decide to pick on the Ottomans and send guys in the stupidest hats you have ever seen to go and conquer Libya. 
and uh, the Ottomans can't really do anything about it. They don't really have a navy, right? And uh, Libya is technically still their province, and the best they can do is send basically the early 1900s versions of special forces, like advisors and guys to coordinate resistance from, from Libyan tribal militias. Uh, one of those advisors is a young Mustafa Kemal, who eventually becomes Ataturk. Uh, and they go in this sort of like last ditch hope because the Ottoman Empire doesn't really have a modern navy to sail out and stop the Italians, right? They lose islands that are close to the Anatolian coast to the, to the Italians. And it's, it's a humiliation, right? Um, because they simply don't have the naval might in an environment where it's becoming increasingly clear that having a navy, that having these sorts of cool new battle cruisers and battleships is essential to being taken seriously as a country, right? You're, you're not, you're a semi-colonial country if you don't have these sorts of vessels. And so they come up with a plan, right? And it's actually, you know, a poked over translation of it, it's, it's a pretty reasonable plan, right? Their plan is by 1914, 1915 to buy abroad because they don't have the ability to produce it at home, right? To buy 10 battleships, uh, a number of smaller ships, cruisers, destroyers, and more importantly, uh, to buy uh, dry docks, right? Like floating uh, sort of submersible barge things that can sink down, go under a ship, and then lift it up, lift it out of the water so you can work on it and maintain it, right? It was a serious plan to build an Ottoman Navy that would be able to resist uh, the sorts of gunboat diplomacy run-ins that they had encountered in Libya in 1897, even during the Balkan Wars where they, sorry, the Balkan Wars being the fights with Bulgaria and Serbia and where they lost a lot of their European territory, where they had to deal with the fact that the European powers could send up fleets at any time and just be like, now nah, we've decided you're going to lose this war. So they created a really good plan, right? Now, around the time Kaiser Wilhelm is sending these ships down to the Mediterranean to establish a German presence, right? He's sending the Goven down to sail around in various places that in the future would be overrun with German tourists and sort of show the German flag and be like, hey, guess what? We've arrived, we're it, we're an empire now. Uh, around that same time, the Ottoman Empire begins ordering and purchasing battleships at shipyards abroad. Now, um, that's going pretty good for them, right? But it's, it's, a little, it's a little tricky because they don't really have a lot of like money. Um, and the reason they don't have money is not because the Ottoman Empire was a poor nation, nation, empire, a poor empire. It was because they didn't control their own tax revenues. Because of this series of semi-colonial, um, what do you call them, activities or rules, this, this thing that took place in the 1870s called, uh, in Turkish, the capitulations, um, the Ottoman Empire doesn't control its own tax revenues right? Uh, European countries do that because they were deeply, deeply in debt to European countries. And so a consortium of like British and French financial interests basically took over all their revenue services and allocated them as they saw fit. So the Ottoman Empire actually was trying to scrape pennies together to modernize its military to defend against exactly this sort of thing. So when they, they raised funds, right? When they were saying, okay, we are going to attempt to build a navy, they had to rely on popular associations. They had to, you know that old like hippie poster about like, oh, one day the schools will have however much money they want and the Air Force will have to have a bake sale to buy a bomber. They literally had bake sales for their navy. They literally asked kids to like give their lunch money, right? They went around to like old ladies at mosques and asked them to like pawn their jewelry and save up to buy battleships. And this was called like purchasing stuff by subscription. And it actually was not unique to the Ottoman Empire. Um, in Imperial Germany, when Kaiser Wilhelm was going nuts and building his giant battle fleet for some reason to rival the British, they'd ask like little Gunther to give his little Fennig from his lunch money to go buy a battleship. And like, this was a very common way of raising money for public projects, not public projects, like military projects in the early 20th century. Um, this is going to be very, very important later because although wealthy industrialized countries in Western Europe 
could raise that kind of money from their population pretty easily. The amount of money that the Ottoman Empire put into fundraising for some sort of modern navy to fend off um, Western powers was was not inconsiderate, right? Like people had made real sacrifices throughout the Ottoman Empire, which I, I would really shy away from describing it as Turkey, right? This wasn't a Turkish necessarily state. It wasn't focused. Its heartlands were not in contemporary Turkey, right? You had little old ladies in Mosul, in Aleppo, in Basra, in Lebanon, right? In Palestine, uh, melting down their jewelry and giving down their jewelry to, to go buy these warships abroad. And it was a huge deal. Just like it was a huge deal for the Germans when they sent that Mediterranean squadron down there, right? Now, uh, the thing about the Mediterranean is it's where all the cool shit goes on. It's where all these great power showdowns over how to divvy up Ottoman territory happen. It's where these many crises happen in Morocco and Libya and Albania. Uh, but the Mediterranean also is low-key, high-key British control. At this point in the early 20th century, they control on one end the Strait of Gibraltar. On the other end, they control the Suez Canal. So it's... You can get in there, it's like Hotel California, right? You can get in there, but you can't really leave. And people know this, right? When they're making these, these sorts of deployments, they kind of understand that, uh, you know, if, if Imperial Germany is sending ships into the Mediterranean, they might not really be able to get them out if, if it really goes down. Um, and they plan for this a little bit, which is where we're gonna take a break. So they've created a Mediterranean squadron, I mean the Imperial Germans, and the Ottoman Empire is literally pinching pennies to buy battleships of their own. And the situation in the Mediterranean is one of British domination and everyone else kind of trying to, you know, find some way to rival that if you're not their buddies. Um, France is there, Italy is there, Greece is trying to buy its own battleships, everyone's just in on it, everyone's going crazy. But everyone also gets, by this point, and I mean by this point, let's call it 1912, that a larger European war is going to happen. And so the Goeben is sailing around with a little smaller cruiser, the Breslau, and they are showing up at all these crises and being German, which is very important. And they, uh, they mostly stop to like take on food and more coal, um, the Goeben doesn't use oil-fired boilers, it uses coal because Germany has a shitload of coal, and remember, they never expected it to have to sail that far. They mostly stop at the port of Pola, which is, I think, in, um, what is today Slovenia. And Pola is all the way at the top of the Adriatic Sea, right, like jutting in on the eastern side of Italy. It's controlled by the Austro-Hungarian Empire, another empire that had a good run, but is on its last legs at this point. Now, uh, Pola is great. There's a great facilities there. You can fix your ships up. You can get, you know, rail loads of supplies and more ammunition for those specialty guns from Germany, but you can't like hang out there because if the Mediterranean bottles you up on both ends, the Adriatic Sea is bottled up right down there at the boot of Italy. And once you're in there, you can't really get out. So yeah. Okay, cool. It's nice to have friends. Everyone likes friends but you're not going to be able to really do much if a, for example, war breaks out between Germany and Britain, which was thought increasingly likely at this time. And uh, this is going to be a bit of a problem 